Hi, I'm Emma Goswell and welcome to Effing Hormones, the podcast about perimenopause and beyond. Now, we always say perimenopause and beyond because at this time of life, it's really difficult to actually figure out what is going on. Is it peri? Is it menopause? Or is it something completely different instead? If you don't know what's going on, listen, we get it because we didn't either. But what we're hoping is that by coming together to chat, to vent, to swear and to have a right old laugh, we can support each other. In this episode, you're going to hear from a woman who can teach you a lot about how to get through some of the curveballs that end up in our way at this time of life. She's called Carmel Cardona. She's a resilience coach. She's experienced medical menopause due to treatment for cancer. So she was only in her 30s when she was experiencing all of this. She's amazing, now seriously amazing, and I cannot wait for you to meet her. Right, time for a little catch-up, and uh, if you're listening to the last series, you'll know that I've been on a bit of a journey when it comes to HRT. Finally, bit the bullet, and I've been taking HRT for, I reckon, a couple of months now, but it really hasn't had a huge effect, I would say, until the last two or three weeks. And in fact, I had lunch with some friends today, and I said, girls, I've just got to tell you, it has finally changed my Woo! life. I said, look, I have cut... Cu- yeah, I came out to a restaurant with some friends today, did not even pack my fan in my handbag because oh, wow. I knew wow. I wouldn't need wow. it. Wow. I, nice. I know, this is a huge turnaround. So in the last two weeks, I've not even bothered gr- running for my fan or just having those moments where I go, I'm going to burn inside. I feel like I'm on the planet... Mercury. <laughs> I haven't had any of those moments. And I've just got on with it. Occasionally I go, oh, I'm a bit hot. I wouldn't say the flushes are completely gone, but I don't have those awful, awful moments where I have to have a fan in my face. I just go, oh, I'm a bit hot and I might take a layer off or I might open my window. I, it's, it's not a hot flush like I have been experiencing for the last five years. Oh, that's so amazing. it has hugely transformed wow. my life, I would say. That's How, how's your sleep now? Yeah, well, I've had occasional nights where I've slept for three or four hours, which if you've listened to me talk before and moan about the fact I wake up every two hours, that's a massive increase. I'm still not there yet. I'm still not there 100% with it. I'm still waking up. But I am totally on the road to feeling so much better. What Go about on, Helen. Uh, the testosterone side of things? Yeah, so... For the first month I had it, I didn't have any testosterone. And I went back to him and went, oh, yeah, bung some of that in as well, please. Oh, God. Testosterone. And I have to say, like, one of the things it's supposed to help with is, like, muscle mass, isn't it? And I've been so lazy the last month. I've done no exercise and no hardly any yoga. So I, I haven't, I have to say, I haven't particularly noticed much You're not going to flex your biceps for us, Sam. It's supposed to particularly help with brain fog, though, as well, isn't it? So is it helping with your brain fog? I have a very small improvement in that. I wouldn't say... Maybe I just haven't been taking it for long enough. And then the other thing, and I'm sure you're all going to ask me about my sex life because it's supposed to help with that, isn't it? Yeah. But all I would say is, I suppose... I suppose in some respects, I actually have a a slight sex drive now, whereas probably for the last couple of years, I haven't particularly had any. So I suppose that is improving. Oh, I bet but your girlfriend's about, happy. Uh, about, that's about as much as I'm prepared to say about it I'm too much of a prude. <laughs> well done, Join Emma. the club. Well done for saying yeah, something. Yeah. Well, I said something. Yes, I said something. I can definitely, there's an improvement in that department. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, honestly, it's taken me so long to get to the stage. And because we've interviewed people, haven't we, who noticed an improvement after thinking back to Colette's interview, after like a few days of taking HRT, and I was like, well, what's wrong with me? Why hasn't it helped? But I really had to go through how much I was taking, almost doubled the um, dosage that I was taking, and it's taken a couple of months for me, but now I really notice it, and I am so blooming glad that I did it. Honestly, it has changed my life. Can you get any... Um, have you had been back to your GP? Have you got anywhere with getting it on uh, NHS prescription rather than having to buy it privately? Mm. Good point. I am still struggling to have lots of conversations with my GP, but they have said that once, you know, I get this documentation from my drug dealer, as I'm calling it, <laughs> my, my HRT <laughs> specialist, they will engage in having that conversation with me. I just haven't sorted it yet because I've just been going, well, I've got this drug at the moment, I'll be fine. But yeah, that's my next stage. As I haven't done it yet to get my next batch. Well, I'm delighted. Let's, um, whee, yippee, hooray. Yay! Yay! Emma's finally scored. 
I <laughs> finally sat. <laughs> I honestly, I'm not even joking though. I do feel like a new woman compared to the last time we probably sat down and recorded. It's it's big difference. You you seem a lot brighter. Yeah. Like I'm not saying you were, you know, in a bad way before, but you genuinely yeah. seem much brighter. Yeah. Uh much more kind of, yeah. It's great. It's great more to see pep, you sort more of vim. bouncing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's cross. Hooray for HRT. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. Bring on the drugs. It only took me five and a half years. Yay! So what about everyone else? How are you getting on, Helen? How's your non-menopause, um, non-perimenopause, but effing hormone problem? Well, funnily enough, I've been reading loads more women on different forums talking about how perimenopause brings out um, histamine intolerance. So I, I do feel part of the gang still. But yeah. I tell you what, I had a, an experience in the past couple of weeks that really has pointed out to me with a massive whammy that I'm very much in midlife. And that is, I need very focals. <laughs> what, what? I'm Laughing. not laughing actually. No, I've got an eye test next week. To be fair, my uh, my eyesight's right. just deteriorating. Okay, answer, yeah. answer me this, Bina. Right, you know the small print ingredients on the backs of jars and stuff. Are you holding yep. stuff out at arm's length to read uh, it? I'm, I'm struggling to actually like. I have to. I have to sort of move it back and forth quite a yeah, lot. Yeah, mate. I'm sorry. To sort of get it into Devote. focus. Yeah. I know. It's I know. Gonna, I know. Happen. I know. It's, I know, I know it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Yeah. Emma, weren't you at my house when I just invested in a little, um, what's it called? A magnifying glass. Oh, you've not got the magnifying oh, no, glass, me. have you? It was you. Have you? because I, I can't me. read labels. That bloody magnifying oh glass God. was hilarious. <laughs> I actually tore strips off Terry when she showed me this magnifying glass. With a, it's got, <laughs> has it got a light? It's got I was a just light like, on what it. is great. this? It's got a little light on it. And I was like, what is this? And now I'm now I'm probably going to have to eat no. my words. I'm sorry, but that is not midlife. That's end of life. And those, <laughs> and those, are, ad, those are advertised in those catalogues where they actually post your catalogues through the door because you're not you're too old to work oh, out the internet. That. That's who that's aimed at. Oh, but I can't, I can't sorry. read I can't read the catalogue. I need the I need the magnifying glass. So, so right. So hang on. So what is it? It's like a sort of. Has it got its own stand? And it's oh, got Helen, a light I'm going to get it. you one. No, no it's a, I don't a hand, want it. A handheld magnifying glass that you can use on the labels to read the cooking oh, instructions mate, on your microwave no, meals. It's no. it's brilliant. She pulled it out when I was round. She pulled she was she pulled it out so proudly. Like look at this. And I was just like, what the hell is this, Terry? Oh, I just was like, oh yeah, sorry. Now I might have like, to eat my words. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I reckon. Can I just point I'm not out behind, that to be honest. none of you are making me feel any better about this whatsoever? No. Have you got them yet, though? No, Helen? Because I'm you know going when you tomorrow get them... to pick them up, and I've got. I know I'm going to get used to them, and I'm having my contact lens well, checked. So I've got to work out how to do contact lenses as well. Meh. Oh, right. Well, let me just give you a little bit of advice because obviously I've been there, done that several years ago. Don't like to boast, but I'm older than all of you. Um, they say apparently it's quite difficult to have something the way you can focus long and short. So sometimes people like literally fall over getting off the bus <laughs> or walking down the street because they just can't cope with the difference in uh, what they're focusing on. Oh, so so be man. careful how you go. Maybe take a walking stick out with you so that you right. don't in case you fall and over. And then shall I put... Or a pop by the shop and buy myself a beige cardigan on the way back. <laughs> Shall I? There's nothing wrong with beige cardigans. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've established <laughs> Terry owns several beige cardigans. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm definitely doing that thing where I have to, if I've got my glasses on, because and and, they're for distance, where I'm having to sort of look down my nose like that. Or, I mean, I'm, obviously you can see me, but, you know, look down my nose at it. So I'm sort of looking out from under the glasses or, or over or that and not or now I've started wearing them at the end of my nose like my dad oh, does no. I was like oh no 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 this has got to we stop we used to go raving for god's sake how, I mean how did this happen I still go raving how did this happen I still go raving just see even less than you used to be able to before <laughs> Oh, but apart from that, your hormones are all right. Do you know, I've been, I've been all right, actually. I've discovered this um, new... I keep banging on about my supplements, but I've discovered a, a new supplement that's having quite a big impact on me. The only thing is they just cost so much money. If it makes you feel good and you can afford it, I'd say do it, yeah. Helen. you just got yeah. to. Just yeah, got but it's to. also important to point this out, you know. People can't afford it, can they? <laughs> Time now for the A to Z of Perry and Menno. This is where we work our way through the alphabet, looking at different aspects of it all. Today, it's a big day because we've finally reached the letter H. Yup. 
Helen, we're just talking about one subject this week, aren't we? So what on earth is going well, on? Well, basically, you've touched on it already, Ems, because we mm. are talking about HRT in this episode. And, I mean, it's just such a massive issue that we decided... Normally, we all take our own whatever letter it is. But for H, it's just such a big deal. We thought we'll just concentrate on HRT. Now, we're not even covering everything to do with HRT because if you go mm. back and listen to previous episodes of F in Hormones, at some point... It comes up. So we're just looking at a couple of aspects of it. I'm looking at uh, bio-identical versus body-identical because I've been constantly confused about the difference between the two. So I'll explain that in a minute. And Terry, you're looking at another aspect of HRT, aren't you? Yeah, so I'm looking at the um, different types of HRT and the ways of administering it and uh, the different types of regimes. So um, we've touched on oestrogen in the past, but oestrogen is basically what you replace because we lose oestrogen when we hit perimenopause. So you can take oestrogen as a skin patch, a gel, a spray or a tablet that you swallow. But you have to basically find what works for you. So I was on patches to start with. So I initially started on something called Everol Sequi, which included oestrogen and progestogen. But for me, that after about 12 months, I was realising it wasn't really working. So I changed to the gel, which I rub onto my skin instead. And it's a pump action gel. So you have a little bit more control over how much, how many doses you can have of that. So the oestrogen that's used in the UK, it's a type of estradiol, it's called, which is the same kind of structure as the oestrogen that's in our bodies. So most people get this when they're prescribed it in whatever form, it's, it's usually estradiol. And it's the one that's made from yams. And then, so there are also, um, I didn't know this, but there are also implants that you can get that you can put under the skin for oestrogen. Really? Um, the implant can be inserted and it can, it sort of lasts a few months. And then there's also vaginal oestrogens, which are available as a cream, a pessary or a ring that's placed in your vagina. Do you know what they're good for, ladies? Oh, God, is, that, is that good for vaginal? Oh, go on. What's it good for, Terry? Gosh. It's for the dryness. <laughs> but the problem with that kind of topical vaginal oestrogen is that it only really works for the vaginal dryness and it doesn't really work for things like the hot flushes. So most people aren't really prescribed oestrogen in that way. Ah, so that's well, yeah, I think I'd be more worried about the hot flush than the vaginal dryness, but yeah. Yeah, well, it depends really, doesn't it? Quality of life in certain cases. and Anyway, but yeah, so that's, that's your oestrogen. So then progesterone, if you have, still have a womb, you have to take a type of progesterone because basically if you're taking oestrogen, you have to take a progesterone as well, which is what helps protect the lining of the womb for basically from womb cancer. There's two types of synthetic progesterone and there's micronized progesterone. So micronized is also known as body identical. It's a little bit confusing, but basically the one that most women are prescribed in the UK is something called eutrogestin. And that's the micronized, more body identical progesterone. And it's usually a tablet, which you take orally, or in some cases it's a pessary. So... um, you know what a pessary is, Emma? You're looking a bit confused. <laughs> yeah, pessary is something you shove up your vag, isn't it? That's the one, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And not a... Uh, <laughs> what's the other one? What, your vajayjay? Yeah. Yeah, what, no, 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 it's not, it's not the other one. one. It's not the other one. No, no, but what's the other na- the name of the other tablets? I've, because a lot of people get confused that they go up and anyway. En- enema. Enemas? No, that's no, 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 no. <laughs> that's when it gets you going out the other way. <laughs> <laughs> um, suppository. There is a word for it though. Suppository. Suppository. Not a suppository. Because I love this. I have, see, I have seen. On, I have seen on some uh, menopause <laughs> things that women are saying, "Oh yeah, you take the uh, the progestogen suppository," and I'm thinking, "No, you no. don't take it as a suppository. That's no. a whole other ball game." <laughs> oh. um, okay. Sorry. So what's right. the difference? No, a suppository is just anything that any pill that you shove up your ass. Oh, up your ass. And an enema is the process of having shit taken out of your ass. I'm such a doctor. I'm so medical. Oh, okay. It's all my medical so... training, you can tell, can't you? <laughs> all those hours on Google. <laughs> Google, doctor, you've been replaced, Dr. Google. Uh, right, so are we, all, are we all clear on that then, on the progestogen? And if you're prescri- if you're prescribed a progestogen... Think I need to go and lie it, down. You... <laughs> you do... <laughs> well... Funny you should say that, but you take progestogen at night because it's a bit of a sedative as well. So uh, it's, uh, it's it's quite a, a mild sedative. Nicely linked there, Terry. Nicely linked. I mean, it can't do any anything good for your sex drive, this, could it really? 
No. Well, let me come to the testosterone. So then if you've got testosterone. Oh, okay. Here we go. So normally you're only prescribed <laughs> testosterone in the UK through private GPs, as we know, Emma's had this experience. Um, right, stop laughing about at to me. fall off and share. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. That conversation just did me in. <laughs> I'm going to have Emma saying arse oh, imprinted on my brain forever after all that. <laughs> sorry. No, do carry on. Do carry on. OK. <laughs> Uh, okay, right. So testosterone, that is what is prescribed after you've been on oestrogen for a while. If it doesn't help with some of your symptoms, you might also be prescribed testosterone, which is usually a gel. And it's usually something that you use in like a pea sized amount on the back of your knee, I think, in some cases. Okay, so if you have a womb, you will most likely be on with something called combined HRT, which is both oestrogen and progestogen. If you have had a hysterectomy, if you don't have a womb, you're most likely going to be offered oestrogen only, HRT, which means that you don't have to have the progestogen side of things. And basically then there are different regimes. The most common regimes are there's a cyclical regime and a continuous regime. So you might be on cyclical HRT or you might be on continuous HRT. Cyclical HRT is something that you most likely have when you're first going on to HRT, if you're still having periods or if you've not had 12 months free of a period, you're most likely going to be put on cyclical, which means that you're on oestrogen the entire time, like the 28 days of your cycle, but you're only on the progestogen for a part of your cycle. If you're on continuous HRT, you'll be on both for the whole period. And you're on con people are put on continuous HRT after menopause, so when they're post-menopausal, yep. so when they've not had so that's a period. Me. That's yeah, what I've got, so you'd yeah. be on, yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so, or if you've been 12 months on cyclical HRT, you then get moved on to a, a continuous HRT. So that's what I'm on now. I started on a cyclical, but I, they've now put me on a continuous HRT. Mm. It is so complex, isn't it? Really? Yeah. It's a learning curve that we're all going on though, isn't it? We only get we only know about the ones that we're put on, which is kind of all you need to know about us as individuals. Like the doctor tells you to do this or the leaflet tells you to do this or whatever. But actually I don't I don't know what my options would have been. I mean I had a you know, as as I've talked about before, I had a fantastic GP. We talked through loads of different options. But a lot of people probably don't have that. They probably just get told, right, this is what you're going on. And it might be with best assessment. It might be, obviously, mm. you know, the doctors do know what they're talking about. But at the same time, there might be other options for people who aren't getting on with one to, to have the, to, to be able to ask for something else that might work for Bina, them. Bina, can I just ask, yeah. you know, when you had that conversation with your GP in the car park mm. and you were on the phone for about half an hour, you said, clearly talking about yeah. loads of things, did did she go through all of that stuff with you or has anyone? She did a little bit. Yeah. I mean, she said there could be, an, you know, take a tablet or go the patches. Yeah. And she sort of explained the pros and cons with each wow. one. Now, I can't remember in great detail, but yeah, I mean, she did. She, and, I, and I sort of didn't particularly want the tablets, but there wasn't the mention of the cyclical versus the non-cyclical thing. I, I don't remember her saying anything about that or the continuous cyclical versus continuous, I guess. One other thing I forgot to mention is that if you, some progestogens, some women will have one anyway. They'll have the um, the coil, which you can also have as an HRT. So that's also an option. But some women use it for... Um... Contraception. Contraception. That's the one. Got really bad brain fog this evening. <laughs> we'll let you off, mate. It's not like we haven't had it before. <laughs> and as lesbians, we don't use a lot of... Yeah, I was going to say, it's not an issue that's ever affected me, so yeah. <laughs> Well, exactly. We've, we've escaped that one yeah, aspect guys, of life, haven't we, as you lesbians? Know, consider yourselves lucky. I had one fitted one time. It was not a pleasant experience, but anyway. Oh. Moving swiftly on. Hmm. No. Who's next, then, for their H? Go on, Helen. Right, so I've been looking at bioidentical versus body identical yeah. HRT, which you touched on earlier, Terry. I have been really, really confused about this throughout the whole time we've been recording this podcast. And I found out... The reason why. So I found this paper from the British Menopause Society saying that all forms of HRT, no matter where they came from, were previously called 
bioidentical. And this paper from the British Menopause Society was saying, no, we want this particular branch of HRT to be called body identical so that you can differentiate between the two. And I was like, ah, it's not just me missing a trick or having a bit of brain fog. It really is confusing. Mm. So hooray, for starters, that wasn't a bit of brain fog on my part. So let me explain the differences between the two. Bioidentical. It's HRT made from plant sources that are promoted as being similar or identical to human hormones. Now, both the NHS and the British Menopause Society, they don't recommend these. They don't recommend bioidentical, oh. OK? Oh, why are you looking like that? Well, because I, now I can't remember what I'm on. I need to oh, buy you're going to have to check now, aren't you? Me right, let me give you the I'll reasons why. Me. This is why British mm-hmm. Menopause Society and NHS say why. They're not regulated. They say there's a lack of batch standardisation, so you don't necessarily know what you're getting each time. Lack of purity. And the prescribers, they are not certified by the British Menopause Society. Um, They also talk about some tests where you can get your saliva tested. And they they were pretty negative about this test being actually related to your symptoms. So you, you didn't have a saliva test, did you, Ems? Not that I recall, but then, you know, I've got no memory either, so I might have been <laughs> well, when I first went to my... <laughs> That's not very helpful, I was going to say, uh, yeah, um, maybe scratch around in the back of the old subconscious. and Anyway, OK, so that's bio-identical, OK? Body... Because I know I'll forget this. Body-identical. They can also be made from natural sources. And again, this is why I got mm. confused, because of the yam thing. Well, I was like, well, that's a natural thing. Yes, they can be made from natural sources like yams, but they're closely regulated and well-researched to make sure it's as safe as and effective as possible. And these are the ones that you get prescribed by your GP. And that's why it's so confusing. Hmm. You're going to have to look this up it's now, a aren't you? It's minefield. Oh. So I'm, re- I'm still confused. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm on, oh. and I don't know whether. So if I'm on bi- bioidentical, I need to get it changed then and say I want different ones. I want body identical. Oh, you, listen, I'm I'm no expert, am I? But the British Menopause Society is saying they're not regulated. So you know, if the body identical ones are the ones that are prescribed by the NHS, they're recommended by the British Menopause Society, and they're regulated. I mean, that's not to say that maybe some women are taking the bioidentical ones and, they're not, and they might be getting something out of it. I mean, they, they may well, but, you know. Mm. Well, if I am then, I'm getting something out of it. It's definitely not a placebo effect. Something's changed my life. You've really got to check where you get your drugs. Yeah. I know. <laughs> see how they cut and splice. It's <laughs> not enough quality control here, is there? <laughs> and that's HRT. If you're loving effing hormones, please rate, review and subscribe. Cheers! Well, it's now time to hear from our guest for this episode, Carmel Cardona. Carmel's a resilience coach. She runs an organisation called Stitch Your Parachute. She also trains and coaches people and organisations through change and difficult times. She herself experienced early menopause from receiving treatment for cancer. She had breast cancer. Then a year after recovering from that, needed treatments for ovarian cancer. So she was in her 30s while going through the menopause and she couldn't take HRT. I'm sure she'll explain a bit more about that in a while. Uh, But we're going to be talking sex in this episode. Oh, yes. Uh, We're going to be talking quite a lot about women's bits as well. So prepare to be enlightened. I feel like this is a first date, so we won't talk about sex straight away, Carmel. I think that would just be a bit rude, wouldn't it, really? (laughs) So perhaps we'll start at the beginning then. So 30s very young to be going through menopause symptoms isn't it really so so how how did it happen for you so it was all related to your cancer treatment wasn't it yeah totally i wasn't anywhere near perry um mm. did never even heard of it um so i was um single single for like my whole entire life and then met this Colombian scientist and within 3 months we'd run away to vegas and got married and wow. I went to Colombia to meet the in-laws and found a lump in my breast on that holiday. Um, got back, got diagnosed with breast cancer. And all of a sudden, the kind of in sickness and in health bit was mainly in sickness for the first kind of three years of our relationship, basically. We, we you know, we didn't, we'd only just got together. It was, we're all in the, in the throes of the initial kind of honeymoon period, literally. Um, so I sort of immediately started chemo and immediately got thrown into the medical menopause and it's interesting because when I, I think when you 
when you go through the menopause naturally, you have a kind of gradual, you know, over the six or seven years that you're in the perimenopause, you kind of gradually um, develop symptoms. You gradually, I mean, I don't know what it's like because I just got chucked off a cliff basically (laughs) and went straight into it. Um, And then what's quite difficult when you're going through cancer treatment is it's, it's difficult to kind of detach what's your chemo side effect from what's the side effect of the menopause. And it's only really now that I'm post-cancer or you know no evidence of disease um and I'm getting stronger and I'm my hair's grown back and I'm kind of you know my skin and my nails are getting better that I'm realizing that actually the residual side effects were there all along from the menopause and it well, wasn't look, necessarily the treatment you're looking great on screen at the moment anyway thank you but, um, <laughs> the thing is with um, cancer treatments and I didn't realize this until my sister went through the same thing and, and cancers feed off certain things in your body don't they so some can feed off estrogen some can feed off other things so if you've got a cancer that's feeding off estrogen your part of your treatment is a hormone treatment, isn't it? To, to remove yeah. the estrogen from your body. So that's yeah, why. So, so my cancer was very, very highly estrogen receptor positive, the highest mm. you can get. So basically mm. estrogen was feeding it all along. So the first thing I had immediately was an injection to stop my ovaries from working. And then I've, I'm now on hormone treatment for the next at least 10 years that stops any residual estrogen that my body might produce from like fat cells or whatever from latching onto any stray cancer cells and I ended up having my ovaries removed anyway because of the ovarian cancer so it's sort of irreversible now but yeah the the estrogen but we'll probably talk a little bit about that later on because I think estrogen related to sex is a little bit different but yeah in terms of HRT it's just a a no-go for me completely so what sort of um, symptoms were you getting then? And, and did you find it difficult, as you said, to work out what was a symptom of cancer and what was a symptom of menopause? Yeah, totally. And it's, it was really interesting because I carried on working through treatment and I was working in a, in a music organisation where it was a very, very young workforce. So no one had ever had cancer before and mm. no one was going through the menopause. So like, you know, I was dealing with hot flushes in the middle of meetings and mega brain fog. I mean, I remember chairing a meeting and forgetting the word for school green and I was like pointing at this thing going you know that thing there that we're projecting on so I just couldn't remember the word for it so I had all of these kind of you know symptoms side effects which I now know are, are very very common in the menopause but at the time I just didn't know what to put it down to and and it was quite distressing I think and I felt quite isolated especially because none of my friends were going through it and you know no one that I knew had gone through it and my mum and her generation hadn't really been very open about it and didn't really talk about it and so yeah, I found it. I found it. It was only really in my cancer support groups where I chatted to other women who'd been put, thrown into the medical menopause in their twenties and thirties that I realised that this was kind of a, a thing that we were all having to deal with. And the oncologists don't even get me started. The the medic medical team mm. don't talk about it at all. I remember. So before you have chemo, you have to sign this consent form, and the oncologist talks you through all the possible side effects. So I had this very sort of earnest young very British man who was like talking me through you know he could cause hair loss you know damage to his skin and I could see the sheet on his desk in front of him and it had um, loss of libido and sexual function and he just skipped over those bits (laughs) and wouldn't talk about it wow didn't mention the menopause couldn't talk about it so yeah so that's interesting. It wasn't that he didn't have the information. He just wasn't willing to talk about it. No, and I think this is quite common. And now that I've spoken to a few other people who kind of work in oncology or, or breast, breast cancer nursing and stuff, people don't really know how to breach the subject with young people. Mm. And, yeah. you know, it, it's a, such a common side effect and, you know, impacts loads of people's sex lives and, and relationships. And, and yeah, I think a lot of medical professionals aren't really trained in, in dealing with that how old were you at that point 38 when I was diagnosed yeah, when mm-hmm. I was starting chemo so you just got married like you say you're in the in the right in a honeymoon period whirlwind romance and then and then this happens yeah um and you're a young person as well so you know clearly your sex life is important to you yeah you know? totally and I think sexuality is a really really key part of how we relate to the world and how we yeah, and it's part of a key part of our identity. And I think 
one of the things I've been really interested in since going through this experience is kind of how, you know, now I'm in a situation where I have no breasts, no womb, no fallopian tubes, no cervix, nothing that you could commonly describe as being feminine body parts or female body parts, you know, Mm. how do I define my femininity? How do I kind of connect with my sense of femininity in a sexual way and in an an everyday way? Um, And how do women do that? Um, all over who you know one in eight women get breast cancer it's very common and so it's been really something I've been really interested in yeah. and I guess how your partner reacted was key to all of that and making you feel better about yourself right my partner is like a, a total saint no. <laughs> um yeah I was very I was very in a way it really drew us closer you know we we learned a lot about each other we saw well you know he saw me at my lowest um during this time um and yeah we've 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 been through quite a challenging few years. Um, but I think one of the things that's really interesting to me, and I've spoken to, I, I now currently volunteer for breast cancer now, and I do phone counselling with other women going through treatment who are early on in their journey than I am. And one of the things that I think has been really important for me is that there's the importance of intimacy and how it's related to sexuality, but it isn't necessarily the same thing. And one of the things that I think was really important for me was all the way through my treatment, even when I was like, you know, bald and ugly and like just looked terrible. I, I We never lost that sense of intimacy. We always had that kind mm. of skin on skin touch. I never felt um, self-conscious about my body. I never felt you know in any way less beautiful and I think that really helped me psychologically but it also helped me physically to kind of get through that that time I think intimacy is incredibly important but did you find that you did have that lack of libido that the doctor referred that didn't refer to <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean it just jumped off a, dropped off a cliff and and mm. we've done a bunch of reading about how if you're on chemo it, it can if you have sex it can transfer to the other person and it just kind of and also I didn't have any energy and I felt like crap and I was constipated and too much information but um you know I didn't I didn't ever feel like it so it didn't really happen and then post-treatment I was full on in the medical menopause you know had my vagina had just completely shrunk couldn't it wasn't even possible And that was when I got referred to a menopause clinic by my oncologist and started that kind of journey of rekindling my sexuality in a way, like reconnecting with my sense of sexuality, which I've done in a variety of ways myself as well, but very much helped as well by the menopause clinic. Mm. Is this the vaginal atrophy that we've heard so much about? And, I believe uh, so, yeah. Have skirted around a little bit and laughed <laughs> embarrassingly because we're just too prudish to talk about it. Well, I also yes. don't think we really, I don't think we really understood what it what it was. Mm. So it, it basically got so small, I couldn't even put a finger in it. It it just shrunk wow. completely. Wow. Yeah. Gosh, is this why when I go for smear tests, it's the most in- painful experience of my entire life, and it was Definitely. fine before. Right, okay. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's my closest to get to having sex, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same as vaginal dryness, though, is it? It's, it's, a different, a di- it's different altogether, isn't it? It causes all sorts of issues. I don't know. I well, had there both. There she so. is with the vaginal dryness. No, no, I mean, it's not... It's what, straight in there. No, no, I mean, no, it's just... What, what, vaginal dryness is just one aspect of it, isn't it? It's, it's, so, t- so tell us what it is, yeah. Carmel. What, what, yeah, and then... So yeah, it's kind of about I, I don't know like exactly in terms of the medical terms, but it's about how the the your, your the lack of estrogen causes the vagina to um, shrink in a way, and that the the tissue isn't very plump and isn't very moist, and um, so it's causing all of that to happen. But what can happen in its worst iterations is that the walls of the vagina stick together; they get so small and they can actually stick oh, together, wow, and then it's really I, I didn't Ooh. get that far, thankfully, but it then you it's very very much more difficult to kind of prize them apart but mm. the um so they they give you dilators they give you like a set of dilators that go from really really small and thin to kind of bigger and bigger and you're supposed to kind of train it to know oh, what to do wow. like people have for big ear piercings kind of <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they look just like that <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I mean, this wow. is this is not you know. I mean, this this happens to women in in menopause. You know, whether it's you know um, medical menopause or not, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah, totally. You know, yeah. and like this is the big 
thing. I mean, you know, and, we, and we've had a bit of a, we've had our running joke about vaginal dryness because no one in this country wants to talk about it, do they? And you know, <laughs> but but the fact is, this has a huge mental health issue and identity issue as well as physical issue for so many women not only going through medical menopause but going through menopause as well i mean it's yeah it's hard very hard is it Go on, Bina. is it painful oh yeah hugely hugely like hugely painful and then of course it creates this psychological problem because you're then anticipating the pain mm, so right. then you just don't want to do anything at all down there and so this is where the estrogen comes back in because I, I did a lot of different stuff because, you know, again, I'm young. I, I, my sexuality is very important to me. I also care about my relationship and don't want it to kind of, you know, I don't want this to cause problems um, as patient as my partner is. But so my oncologist prescribed me with vaginal moisturiser, which you can use to regularly try and replenish it. Didn't really work for me. You use loads of different lubes. Uh, I mean... I'm bisexual, so my kind of version of sexuality and sexual kind of satisfaction doesn't necessarily mean, you know, penis and vagina. It can it can be quite creative, and and we've been very creative, um, Good. bought all sorts of toys, um, and been chasing other types of sexual pleasure. You know, it's not necessarily all about the pursuit of a specific goal. But I have ended up, after lots and lots of research, starting to use vaginal pessaries, so Vagifem, which are kind of these tiny little tablets that you insert into your vagina every other day-ish. And that has changed my life. I mean, literally, almost immediately, my vagina was healthier than it's ever been. And... Yeah, so that's completely changed things for me. But the research shows that even if you have an estrogen-fed breast cancer, it stays localised within the vagina. It doesn't. It, the oh. the estrogen doesn't leave the vaginal area, so it doesn't pose a risk. So yeah. Vagifem is is estrogen. Yes, it's an it's a tiny little e- tablet of estrogen that you put inside your vagina. So it's like topical estrogen rather than taking it in your mouth. You you put it okay. inside your vagina. Okay, and that doesn't have any side effects in terms of the cancer or anything else, then. No. Negligible in terms of the statistics, it it doesn't it hasn't been proven to make any difference. And I think I think this is the thing about menopause in general and cancer survivorship. I think you're constantly weighing up your kind of quality of life as well as kind of risk, and you know that's just kind of what I'm doing all the time on a daily basis. And for me, my sexual health is extremely important and worth you know, that kind of negligible risk. Can I just ask, um, because you had your breast removed as well, I mean, obviously there's a lot of physical things that happen, but your body changed, like, quite rapidly by the sounds of it. I mean, that that must have been sex aside and, you know, intimacy aside, you in your own mind coming to terms with how your body must have changed so dramatically and so quickly. Like, that, that must have been quite tough yeah and I was a real 1950s chick as well I wore these like lovely had really big boobs I had like f cup boobs tiny little waist and a big bum so I like wore all of these gorgeous 1950s frocks and had Mm. great accessories and you know that was kind of my style and then of course completely now have no boobs I have no reconstruction and I don't wear prosthesis so I've I sold all of my clothes on eBay and went and bought loads of moo's and caftans and completely changed my style <laughs> and, and I really loved that for me it was also you know a part of reclaiming myself reclaiming my identity embracing the opportunity to live the, the next half of my life with a different body shape and, and wear clothes I could never wear when I have, I could never wear dungarees. I wear them all the time now because, you know, they look great. Um, and I think that's kind of my attitude throughout this whole thing has been, uh, without wanting to be like, you know, toxic positivity or anything, but really it's it's been incredibly difficult to go through but what is it that I can take from it that that helps me regain a sense of my my identity and and yeah that's that's been part of it that's so good to hear and you know we all talk about the fact that we're all going through change but we have to try and cling to the positive side of it and we are becoming new people in a sense but you sound like you've gone through it in spades really so how long ago was all this when did this start so I was diagnosed in February 2017 with breast cancer and then um, March 2019 with ovarian cancer. Um, so I had chemo, surgery and radiotherapy in 2017, pretty much the whole year. 
and but that was just a lumpectomy and then I found out I have the the following year I found out I have the BRCA1 gene mutation which is the Angelina Jolie gene yeah. uh, the only thing I've got in common with her and um, <laughs> <laughs> so then Surely. I had to have a preventative oophorectomy which is the removal of ov- ovaries and fallopian tubes and then they found early stage ovarian cancer so I was incredibly lucky that I had a pushed to get a BRCA test b decided to have the preventative surgery otherwise I never would have found the ovarian cancer so early Gosh. so I was really really lucky then wow. I had more more surgery to remove everything basically and more chemo and then in December 2019 I had both my breasts removed as a preventative measure and that was the last kind of active treatment now I'm on hormone treatment and various other stuff so so it's all fairly recent I mean yeah we're not talking years ago here this is all yeah uh, and we've had a pandemic in the middle of it all oh yeah that was great just as I recovered from three years of cancer treatment where I basically couldn't have a life blooming covid hit (laughs) and the whole world started to discover what I'd already just learned about how it impacts on your sense of time and your sense of you know mortality and Mm. everything how do you feel about your, your body now? I think that's a really interesting question and I think that's something that I kind of grapple with all the time. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the NHS, which, I mean, God love them, they saved my life twice and I've had an incredible, I've been incredibly lucky and very well cared for all through treatment. But they really look after the physical side of you and they're very much interested in kind of curative treatment. Um, you know, they the, the mental health, care wasn't really there at all and I discovered sort of the hard way that you have to kind of look after your own mental health alongside your physical health and had a bit of a wobble after I finished treatment for breast cancer and it was all over and I thought and it just I just lost it (laughs) and then during my ovarian cancer I was much better looking after my, my mental health so I've been quite interested in you know how I can look at this trauma that I've been through essentially and 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 get growth from it rather than have it throw me into PTSD and in terms of my body my body has changed dramatically you know I've got lower limb lymphedema which means that my legs are very swollen and and my pelvis is very swollen and I've got scars from like my navel down to my um, pelvis and then obviously across my chest there's loads and loads of different physical things I'm living with but I mean God, I love my body. Look yeah. at what it's done. Look yeah. at what it's got through. I'm so proud of it. Even though like it seems that on a like monthly basis at the moment, something else happens that sends me into A and E. I've had three trips to A and E this year because of because of other like residual side effects. I couldn't use my hand for six weeks because I got um really bad tendonitis. Um, and anyway, a load of other stuff. Don't won't dwell on that. So. I've come to terms with the fact that my body is fragile. And I think that was the hardest thing to come to terms with for me. I've always been a very strong Yorkshire lass with the constitution of a horse. And then all of a sudden I'm now quite fragile, actually, and I can't do everything. And that was incredibly difficult to kind of come to terms with. But I think I put in and I think this happens a lot with the menopause. It's less about symptoms getting better and more about you learn ways of dealing with them to minimize their impact on your life in that vein you've done quite a bit of work with other people who've you know returning to work after illness I've read on your website that you do uh, quite a lot of work with people who've gone back to work after illness and uh, you do a lot of work with resilience what does the resilience mean to you in terms of coping with your um, surgical menopause now well, I've um, I did a lot of reading when I was going through treatment about, like I said, about post traumatic growth and about um, kind of resilience in general. And I've developed my own model of resilience, which is um, five key pillars of resilience. And I've developed training around that. And it, a lot of it just came about because after I went freelance because. Um, so often when you have something massive happen in your life, like cancer or the menopause, you, it makes you reevaluate things. And I think a lot of people end up going through a bit of a career change. So I decided to go freelance and then the pandemic hit. So I had to and I was in the clinically extremely vulnerable category. So I had to shield for 18 months, basically oh. stay at home. So I started delivering resilience training online and it just took off. People were just really it was really, really people were really resonating with it. Um, and so and I, it's, it's kind of become a little bit of a 
of a dirty word, resilience, these days. And I think there's also part of it that's kind of like, it's your own responsibility. Well, it isn't. There's bigger structural systemic problems, but there's a lot that we can all do in our own life um, to help us be more resilient, like... um, developing more self-awareness and getting feedback from other people about ourselves or cultivating our sense of purpose and understanding what our values are that then help guide us to make decisions founded in it with a really strong foundation um nurturing relationships with other people building networks feeding our joy one of my pillars is feed your joy which is about um you know always making time in your life for the things you know bring you happiness and meaning and engagement um and so i've kind of woven um these things together to create this resilience training but then I also work one-to-one as coach coaching people who are returning to work after an illness or after completing their family and coaching senior level um, women who have reached the menopause and, and are re-evaluating their careers quite considerably. Can I just say I think you're absolutely bloody amazing I really oh, do God. I really do Thanks, honestly what a, can I clap what now? Incredible <laughs> Yeah, you can clap. Yeah, you can clap now. Oh, you're making me blush. Oh no, it's a hot flush. I am interested to know, though. I mean, how, when it comes to resilience, when it comes to you going through this traumatic experience, how much did you know about resilience at that time, and did you have this approach towards it then, or was it something that you learned during and after? Definitely something I learned during and after. I don't mm. think. I really could have defined resilience to you before. But I I think for me, that's what resilience is, is it's about, it's not about, um, people call it, people use phrases like bouncing back and stuff. It's not about bouncing back. It's about, you know, these things, life is going to be challenging. We are going to have things happen to us that are difficult. It's about how we learn from it, how we grow, how we adapt, and how we then use that learning into helping us with things in the future. So it's really about, you know, changing. It's actually about growing and changing. Yeah, we've said that so much about menopause. Yeah. What would you say to um, NHS staff who work in the area of oncology or or menopause that, you know, what would you want them to to hear if if you could get them in a room and and get them to listen to you about how you were treated? That's a great question. Um, That's a great question. I, I feel like a lot of it's just about not being afraid to talk about these things, not being afraid to be the one to start the conversation. I think there are a lot of patients, a lot of young women going through it who just don't have that information. They don't understand what's happening to them. They can't anticipate it. They were never told about it. Um, you know, I ran a workshop recently for women under 40 who had gone through the medical menopause and not one of them had been told about it when they started treatment. Not wow. one of them. Wow, that's so shocking, So it's just it? talk about it, communicate yeah. about it, don't be afraid of it. Well, I think it's quite sort of uh, symptomatic of how we're treated medically a lot in, in the West, I guess, that we're treated on individual things. And as women. But we're not treated... I mean, this, it sounds like there needs to be a more holistic approach to, to how people are treated rather than it just being, right, we're just going to focus on the cancer now and then yeah. we're going to focus on this and then we're going to focus on that. And I think a lot of it, it, it's it's very much that. It's like we're treating the cancer and then, well, we've cured you now so you can go away your on pop. your merry way. Yeah. And like, you know, it's, this is the rest of my life. This is This is mega. So I've actually decided to do a PhD in um, sexuality, living with and beyond cancer. And uh, yeah, and it's all very kind of, you know, academic, but um, it's really interesting because actually it's just not talked about. And if it's talked about, it's all talked about in terms of sexual dysfunction and, and all this kind of like, oh, you know, these people have sexual problems rather than actually framing it in a it's, it is possible to regain that sense of a sexual self after cancer. You know, you can get there, but you probably need some help and there needs to be more investment, I think, in interventions to help people and communication to help people. And again, so so many parallels here with, 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 with the menopausal experience as well, you know, whether it's, whether it's surgical menopause or not, you know. Definitely. It's the same thing, isn't it? And I can I can imagine how you know I mean I was talking to someone the other day who was saying that some women grieve well, with the loss of their periods and and it's like a kind of bereavement for them because you know they haven't got that cycle anymore and there's all these I mean there's so many massive issues 
swirling yeah. around with this and we just need to talk about it like as brilliantly as you're talking about it now Carmel and that's what we're hoping to do with with Effin Hormuz as well and just make it okay to talk about can you can you explain to me why it's called stitch your parachute so it's it's based on the premise that it's wiser to stitch your parachute while you're safe on the ground the wait till you're falling out of the plane <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good advice. So, yeah. so, you know, there are things that we can do to build our resilience before we hit the crisis point so that when that crisis point happens, we're much more likely to, to kind of have a really robust parachute to help us. Well, how do you stitch your parachute, Carmel? I cook Ottolenghi food a lot. Nice. Um, <laughs> I, I like learning new things. I love going out for walks. Um, noticing things, spending time with friends. Yeah, I mean, like all wearing the your dungarees, stuff, really wearing dungarees, yeah, I love them. <laughs> and doing a podcast. Your as well. Yeah, yeah. So I've been interviewing people about their own experiences with challenging things that have happened into the, in their lives and what they've drawn on um, to give them resilience when they're going through that. And I'm hoping that each person's story will really help listeners kind of gain some ideas or some inspiration for their own resilience. I'm really excited about it. I've had some amazing guests on it and just some really, really awesome stories of people who just have been so generous with their honesty and their and their sharing. It's almost as good as our it. podcast, actually, if I'm honest. Not quite, not no, quite. I mean, obviously not, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Effing hormones. Sweary, but supportive. Carmel, are you ready for this? Yeah. It is time for your peri peli peri. If I could actually speak, it is time. <laughs> Put your teeth in, Emma. For your. Nom, nom, nom. Uh, it is time for your peri peri grilling. Uh, this is where we get to see where you are on the peri trump scoreboard. Uh, you'll also get to nominate your peri or meno hero in our fabulous awards, the Effins, um, and you also get to choose a song for our magnificent Spotify playlist. Uh, I'll give you the criteria for that in a bit. Uh, but first of all, let me remind you about Perry Trump. So you've got to think like top trumps, basically, but for peri or meno symptoms. Um, so Helen's done a quick Google to find out which symptoms are rarer and which ones are more common. Um, it's a very quick Google, we should point out. It's not really medical facts. We are not experts. Um, so basically what happens in the game is the rarer the symptom, the higher the score. Uh, the more common ones, like hot flushes, even though they're blooming awful, get a lower score. Does that make sense, Carmel? It does, yeah. So you've gone through our little um, sheet with um, different things on, and what did you get? Were there, so many, were there some rare ones that you got? Um, well, obviously I didn't get any sore boobs, because I don't have any boobs. I was, uh, was going to say, we need to, we need to update our uh, Perry Trumps, actually. Yeah, we need to do it. We'll, think... we'll, do, it. we'll do a surgical menopause yeah, Perry Yeah, Trumps. you've blown it out of the water, Carmel. <laughs> <Yeah, Bob. laughs> um... Yeah, I, I um, obviously had all the, the things we've talked about in terms of libido and vaginal dryness. And um, I did have the irregular heartbeat, actually. I ended up seeing a cardio oncologist at one stage recently because my heart beat, my heart beat went a bit funny and still is a bit funny. There's a name Ooh, for it, which okay. I can't remember. I get the tingling and the electric shocks, which are both... I didn't know that they were menopause until oh, I saw that. Oh, electric shocks, yeah. Yeah. Well, That's quite a high scorer, points. isn't it? Electric That's a shocks. nine. Yeah. It's a nine, wow. yeah, she's going to have a high score, girls. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what your. I can't remember what your previous guests have had. Uh, you know, all the normal uh, brittle nails and fatigue. Oh, dreadful Oof. fatigue. It's Mood swings, easy. rage, all that stuff. Have you totted it up? Do you have a total score for us? Carl? I'm an eighty-three. Oh, that's quite high. Is it? That's quite high. Hang on a sec. Let me see if I've got my. She's going to look at the scoreboard. <laughs> The scores on the door, George. Compared to last. Oh right, your your third, Carmel. Oh Oh, my third. Sue Devaney, who's on a previous series, 125. That's holy moly. She must have had all of them. (laughs) Yeah, she's just just really bad at maths. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't include hair loss because when I started the menopause, it all fell out. But then it's been growing back since then, so. I, I don't oh. think I can count that. So fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, so you're third. Colette Walsh uh, at 94, Ooh. and uh, yeah, you come in third. Ooh. Wow. I think we should start the, the scoreboard again though for for series two. Uh, so at yeah. the moment, so far you you're winning. <laughs> but as we always point out, <laughs> is it out, really this a, is, a game yeah, that you want to win? This is not the game. Yeah, this is not the game that you want to win. But anyway, you could take some kind of uh, 
pride on the leaderboard, I think. You definitely want to lose. <laughs> right, it is time now for the Effins. Uh, this is where you get to nominate someone who's got you through uh, this in one way or another. So it could be a friend, it could be a partner, someone that's really been there through your hormonal rages, or it could be a medic who's been particularly good, although judging by the sound of your oncology, you, just, you won't be nominating him. <laughs> um, or it could be someone in the public eye raising awareness. Um, so, Carmel, who are you going to award your Effin to? Well, my effing goes to uh, Dr. Claire McCauley, who is an incredible woman who I've met uh, relatively recently, but she's just completely changed my whole attitude towards this. She's um, she's a breast cancer oncologist based in Glasgow, but she's been training over the last few years in somatic sexology. And she started a group called The Pleasure Possibility, which is all about... Um, the possibility of pleasure in menopause and it's only for menopausal women and non-binary people and anyone who basically wants to continue to have a very very happy sex life in menopause and she does incredible stuff yes she's really been amazing sounds like we need to book her we, we do need to book her it sounds like she's She'd gonna be, be in your phd is she She's one of my collaborators. Yeah, she's yeah. she's been really generous, and she's she's one of those kinds of people that will talk about sex on LinkedIn. She's got an absolute no shame. So Amazing. I love her. Great. She's really inspiring. <laughs> so, Dr. McCauley Woo! sounds brilliant. Woo! Yay! Woo! Yeah, well done. <laughs> A very very worthy effing, I would say. Right, uh, and finally, you also get uh, the huge honour of adding a tune to the FN Hormone Spotify playlist. Uh, the rules for this are, well, they're not many rules, to be honest, and rules are there to be broken, but generally speaking, you're getting your, to choose a song that gets you up and going if you need to, or maybe just a song that makes you feel like a badass woman, um, or maybe something to express the rage that you've been experiencing as well. Uh, so what is your choice, Carmel? What are you going to go for? So my choice is Florence and the Machine, Shake It Out. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons why I've picked this. It's a, it's a brilliant tune and I love dancing to it. Um, but I think the, some of the lyrics were really, really quite helpful and pertinent. I think there's a lovely line where she says, it's hard to dance with the devil on your back, but given half the chance, would I take any of it back? And I think that's something really key about resilience is, you know, sometimes when you look back at something that's been really hard in your life, um, it's shaped who you are today and who you are today is an amazing person. So would you want to change that? Um, and there's that line, it's always darkest before the dawn, which I think is like a metaphor for menopause because it's going to be really, really tough, but you come out the other end and from what I've heard, it's amazing. So, yeah. Oh, that's so good, Carmel. I'm so, honestly, you've nearly brought me to tears with that yeah. reading those lyrics out there. I'm like, oh, God, it's well such, done. Such a poetic song, isn't it? It's I know. Lovely. Great oh. choice. Thanks. Wow. I'm not really very Excellent. into music, but I saw Florence and the Machine in, in concert in Sydney a few years ago and was just like blown away. It was one of the best concerts I've ever been to in my life. Oh, I can honestly, honestly sure say you've got better taste than me. So, <laughs> <laughs> are you are you the Enya yeah. fan? I am. Yes. Yeah. How, did you, how did you How did you guess? <laughs> I can vouch for that, Carmel. She's not wrong. <laughs> we, we just Sorry, we Tessa. just banned Terry from the Spotify playlist. <laughs> do you know? Hey, do you know? One day, Enya's gonna. On. One day, Enya's gonna get in touch with us, and we're just gonna all feel really <laughs> shit about all this. <laughs> Listen, she's the one living in a blooming castle in Ireland. We're like, you know, I think I, I don't think she's gonna care about us lot like, going on about it, to be frank. <laughs> right, I think we need to give Carmel another great big clap because she's been absolutely brilliant. Yay! Thank you. Thank you Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for this episode of Epping Hormones. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you will hear from us again in a couple of weeks' time. We do want to say a big welcome to all of the members of our new Facebook group. What do you mean you didn't know we had a Facebook group? Well, we do, and you can join us as well. All you need to do is search for Effing Hormones Podcast, and it should come up. Uh, don't forget, that is Effing with no G. And, of course, we'd love you to rate, review, and follow Effing Hormones... And please tell whoever else needs to know. We are here for them too. Thanks so much. See ya. 